Intel's $1,000 i9-7900X has been released in the wild, and so far around the internet it has been receiving pretty negative press, and in some ways rightfully so. Before we get on to this review, I will point out, and have to get this off my chest, what the hell are you doing Intel? This is a $1,000 flagship CPU, and you're putting thermal paste between the IHS and the die. I mean, come on, it's like buying a Ferrari and then getting the keys to it and realizing the paint job's all messed up. It's not right. If you're gonna sell a premium product, please make it premium in all aspects and not skimp on things like the thermal paste, which actually affects performance. Though with that aside, let's get on with the review and actually see what's good about this CPU and how it performs in gaming and also productivity. Welcome back to Tech Yes City. This is Brian coming to you guys today with a review of this CPU right here, the flagship 7900X. And before we get onto the results, which are kind of conflicting since they do differ from others, I will give a big thank you to ASRock for sending out the motherboard and CPU to do this review. And also another big thank you to Steve from Hardware Unbox for sending over an engineering sample to double check and make sure it wasn't all in my head when it comes to some of the problems. However, if you guys are looking for an awesome X299 board, then ASRock do have a lot of different flavors available. They have the X299 Killer, they also have the X299 Taiji, which I use predominantly for these benchmarks. They also have the X299 Gaming i9, which is a really good motherboard. So they have all price points covered with exceptional components on the VRM. Not only that, overclocking was a breeze on this motherboard and everything worked out really well, even from the get-go. I'll put a link in the description below where you can find out more. So first things first with Skylake X. It does have a similar name to Skylake, but it shouldn't be confused with Skylake, which is also similar to Cabby Lake, which is also similar to Cabby Lake X. Essentially in ways, Skylake X uses a different architecture in the ways that the cores communicate with each other. On Skylake, for example, they use a ring bus, which is a ring around the outside of the cores that allows the cores to communicate to each other in a bi-directional manner. Skylake X, on the other hand, uses what's called the mesh architecture, where there are additional points and pieces of communication to allow the cores to efficiently communicate with each other when there's higher core counts. Because on the ring bus, as the core counts grew, Intel found themselves with exponential power increases for the efficiency of the cores themselves. So to counteract this, we now have what is known as Skylake X. And AMD, on the other hand, they use what they call the Infinity Fabric to connect up CCX modules. So it's a little bit complex, but one thing to note with the 7900X is it does have a reduced level three cache size, and it also has an increased level two cache size, which how this would pan out in productivity and gaming had every one second guessing. However, without further ado, let's check out what this flagship is capable of.
So the results are in and you guys are probably wondering why some of my benchmarks are differing to other reviewers. And I also had similar results to other reviewers a few days ago. It wasn't until I went to finalize this review today that I went to retest things and I was shocked. I was getting some games that were getting extra 20% in certain scenarios. Take for example, Far Cry Primal. When I initially tested this a couple of days ago, I was getting around 94, 95 FPS on average out of the box. Then I retested it today and I'm getting over 110 FPS. Incredible and substantial increase in numbers. Also, I had conflicting results before I did today's revisit on the benchmarks. I was getting some benchmarks that were beating the 7700K, but then some that were losing quite substantially. Even though now the 7900X does still trade blows with the 7700K, it's more as expected with a processor that carries the same IPC as the 7700K and also clocks to similar levels. So delving further into the productivity benchmarks reveals that the 7900X is one mammoth of a workhorse. If you guys saw those Adobe Premiere Pro final render times, this thing beats everything and when you overclock it, you actually extract even more performance. Every other benchmark I did, the 7-zip, the Excel, also the Presonance Mixdown, all this was beating the competition. However, that's as expected with a flagship product. And then when we contrast that with games, you now have a CPU that essentially can do it all. I know people are thinking, oh, I wanna get a productivity, more cores, more threads, or should I have to go with a gaming CPU that can't do productivity as well as other CPUs? With the 7900X, there's pretty much no compromise. And even in certain games, it was actually beating the 7700K with my 1080 Ti. I was really shocked to see this in certain games. We take for instance F1 2016, that was actually utilizing all 20 threads. I was really shocked to see this result and that resulted in a lot better benchmark numbers in terms of average and minimum FPS. Though the kicker for me was the streaming benchmarks. This thing performed exceptionally well when it came to using XSplit at a five megabits per second output at 1080p 60 FPS. It dropped literally nothing off those FPS numbers when you compare that to the Ryzen 7 1700, which only dropped a little bit, and also when you compare that further to the 7700K. Although it does have more cores and more threads to thank for that, I also believe the ability to use quad channel memory also helps the 7900X a great deal. So basically, if you're a guy that wants to do it all, the 7900X is indeed doing it all. However, there are some caveats to this product, and that is first of all, the thermal paste on the die connecting to the IHS. I did test this with two different CPUs. So the one that I got sent, I delittered that straight away. And in hindsight, I probably should have tested the temperatures before and after on the exact same CPU. Because I thought I had two CPUs, I thought they'd perform similar, but they actually didn't. They were using different wattages at the same voltage at the same clock speeds, and it differed by actually quite a lot. One CPU was drawing around 160 something watts, and then the other CPU was going closer to 200 watts. So I actually had to counteract this and down uh, the voltage a little bit on one to match up the watts. And when I did this, the di temperature difference wasn't so big. I was getting around a three degree difference between a delitted CPU and a lidded CPU. However, there was one thing and that was the delitted CPU was using more watts. So it should be putting out more heat essentially. And this was a problem and it means that the lidded CPU with the cheap thermal paste is performing worse than a delitted CPU with liquid metal on it. And this really isn't a good thing for the consumer who's spending $1,000 and wants the best performance, not only in the numbers that they're putting out on the screen, but also in the product itself. I believe if Intel soldered this thing to the heatsink, to the die, they would have a lot less complaints, at least from me anyway. Though now it's time to talk about the power consumption, which around the internet, everyone's saying this thing is a heater, it'll serve you well in winter. And it certainly can if you overclock it high enough. I found for a 10 core, 20 threaded processor at 4.6 gigahertz, this thing was burning over 200 watts. However, you have to keep in mind that it's the only 10 core, 20 threaded processor that goes to 4.6 gigahertz. When we look at even the eight core and 16 threaded processors out there, any of those can't go as high as this, which has two more cores and four more threads. And furthermore, if we look at the out of the box settings, which is four gigahertz, which is really high for 10 cores, 20 threads, that performs at around 140 watts power usage in IDA 64. So I was really actually not too surprised with the power consumption figures. They weren't abysmal world ending. And actually in ways I've got respect for Skylake X because Intel have essentially pulled off the safety brakes and allowed this CPU architecture to go sky high at the result of being very hot on both the VRM and the CPU. And that essentially is the option for enthusiasts who want to overclock this thing as high as they can get it. And if they have extra money for custom water cooling on not both the CPU, but also 
the VRM, then this will allow them to get really high figures. For most people out there, I'd recommend getting this CPU, getting an all-in-one, getting a $230 X299 motherboard, and then just calling it a day at around 4.4 gigahertz or even 4.3 or 4.2. However, above 4.4 gigahertz, this thing does get extremely hot. In both cases of the littered and the delittered CPU, I was getting around 100 degrees Celsius and it was actually starting to throttle after a little while in Ida64 after a good 20 minutes. However, with that said, I was still able to get the benchmarks done at 4.6 gigahertz. So even in the real world, the gaming figures and the benchmarks, I don't believe you'll ever get to 100 degrees, but it's still good to know that this CPU does get really hot and you will need really good cooling to keep it under control. So the next and probably the last thing to talk about with X299 is the RAID keys, which I don't agree with. I think Intel, if someone's paying a lot of money for a motherboard and X299 chipset, you should just give them all the options for free. However, it's not as bad as people think. And with the RAID keys, if you have SATA 3, for example, it doesn't even pertain to that. So for instance, if I want to use my RAID 0, RAID 1, or RAID 5 over my SATA 3, which is what I use it for, I don't have to pay Intel anything. I just have to buy an X299 motherboard. But what it does relate to is the add-in cards for NVMe drives. If you have some of these and you want to uh, essentially network them in RAID 1 or RAID 5 or RAID 10, then you do have to pay Intel for a license key. However, RAID 0 should still work with the add-in cards. I believe M.2s that are added into the motherboard itself still are able to be rated at perfectly fine without paying any additional money. So now it's conclusion time and who is the 7900X for? <laughs> well, I think it's actually for everybody, but providing you can afford it. It's a $1,000 CPU. And firstly, the biggest thing that I hate about it is the fact that it's got thermal paste on it. It should have been soldered from the IHS to the die. I think if they had done that, they wouldn't have copped anywhere near the negativity that they're getting now. Also those RAID keys, but that is an extra feature that is being introduced on X299 itself. I think Z270 motherboards and also even previous X299 or I mean X99 motherboards don't support that feature. However, for $1,000, it's nowhere near as efficient in terms of price performance as the i7-7700K for gaming and also the Ryzen 7 7700 for pretty much everything. But what it is, is the best in slot in terms of a CPU. It is a flagship and it does perform like so. And also you will need, keep in mind, expensive gear. You will need an X299 motherboard, which does run higher than a Z270 or an X370 motherboard. And you will generally need more expensive cooling. A 240mm radiator would be a minimum, in my opinion, for one of these if you wish to overclock. If you don't wish to overclock, you will get away with an air cooler. And out of the box, it actually does run really well. And there actually is no need to delid. And on the note of deliding, I wouldn't recommend it with such an expensive CPU, even though I did it myself. Anyway guys, I hope you enjoyed today's review and if you did then be sure to hit that like button. This one took me a long time. I had to spend days rechecking things just like the Ryzen review and then making sure it wasn't all in my head and then double checking things and then triple checking things. And what we have here is the 7900X review. Though one thing as well with the two different samples I was really surprised. The 7900X retail sample is actually different to the 7900X engineering sample for the microcode and that actually caused issues in the BIOS. For instance, on the motherboard, I had this problem where the idle temperatures were just spiking the VRM so hot. And this was in idle when it was only using 50 watts. However, when I changed over to the engineering sample, it didn't have this problem at the same settings. And then I changed settings around and there was all different things happening. But anyway, guys, I'll catch you in another tech video very soon. Peace out for now. Bye.